I'm Dr. Amit Padanang, as uh, Dr. Richard has already introduced me. Thank you for that. And a very warm namaste from Nepal. So uh, this is a picture aerial view of the hospital where I work. And uh, I have two professors who, uh, who have been training us. And that's Professor Dr. Shilpakar, who was, I think, two years uh, ago he was here. Dr. Mohan Sharma, he's uh, currently the head of the department. Dr. Gopal Sadai, me, and Dr. Binod, we are the three junior faculties working there. So first of all, let us look at, look at Nepal at a glance. Uh, it is a landlocked country sandwiched between uh, China on the north and uh, India in the south. It, is, uh, it has a population of around 28 million, and uh, it has one of the eight of the 10 tallest mountains in the world. It is uh, in the in Lumbini. It is uh, the birthplace of Lord Buddha, and it has a literacy rate of around 66 <coughs> percent. Life expectancy has climbed up to 70 years, 70.2 years now, and the GDP is around 1,034 dollars per capita. So, just uh, going through the neurosurgery uh, timeline in Nepal, Professor Dian uh, Dinesh Nath Gongul in 1962, he was actually a general surgeon. He did from orthopedics, general surgery, and sometimes neurosurgery. It was the first time in 1962 that he operated on a patient with uh, gigantism, a pituitary adenoma transcranial. It was not until <coughs> and, uh, in uh, 1988, uh, it was the time the first city arrived in the uh, first hospital in Nepal, that was Beer Hospital, first civilian hospital. And uh, the dawn of neurosurgery started in <coughs> 1993 when professor, late Professor Upendra Dev Kota, who was trained in, in the Glasgow Institute of Neurosciences, he developed neurosurgery into a distinct faculty. And two years later, Professor Norman Bacon from US <coughs> has taken up a challenge to start neurosurgery at the second center that was at our hospital in 1995. And finally, in 2007, we had the first uh, uh, neurosurgical society, that is Nepalese Society of Neurosurgeons, initially established with just around 12 members in 2007. So <coughs> currently, uh, <coughs> according to the JNS 2019, uh, the recommended population, recommended neurosurgeons to population ratio is around 1 is to 10,000, uh, 100,000 uh, population ratio. So America's is around 0 0.76 per 100,000 population. China is 0 0.43, and Japan has well over six neurosurgeons per 100,000 population. Nepal has around uh, 85 neurosurgeons in uh, 28 million population. That's around 0 0.3 per 100,000. So uh, with the recommended standard of 1 to 100,000, we are currently at a deficit of 215 neurosurgeons. We have a graduate flow rate of around 15 to 20 graduates per year, so we have a target of reaching the expected uh, ratio by 2030, maybe. <coughs> you can see in uh, 1980, uh, 1989 was uh, when the recruits into neurosurgery started. It has steadily been growing. And uh, 2019, I think we have, uh, we have around 85 neurosurgeons registered in the country. But the problem, the main problem is that uh, most of the neurosurgeons are, again, uh, localized in and around the city. And we have a few neurosurgeons on the eastern side of Nepal, but many of the states don't even have a single neurosurgeon working. So there are two, uh, two established neurosurgical training programs, and maybe one or two which are like, uh, on and off due to several reasons, uh, one of which is ours among the two. Beer Hospital and Thirvan University Teaching Hospital are the two centers that have consistently been producing neurosurgeons during this time. Uh, however, major bulk of the neurosurgeons are from, uh, trained from various other countries like China, Bangladesh, Japan, and India. So what are the opportunities for the uh, neurosurgical patients in our country? You can say uh, neurosurgical services are widely available, at least in, in certain areas, at a very low cost. Uh, uh, you can, like, 50 cents, uh, a patient can get a neurosurgical consultation in a hospital like ours at 50 cents, and uh, maybe a $5 per consultation in the same day on a private hospital in, in Kathmandu. The government has uh, recently started support system for the head and spine injury cases and brain tumor by uh, providing $1,000 for each patient. 
The overall wait time in public hospitals is around two to three months, and uh, most of the major cranial surgeries can be covered by just around 500 US dollars. In private hospitals, there's no delay for surgery. Uh, it can be done within the same week, and the cost for a typical craniotomy ranges from 1,500 to 2,000 US dollars. What are the opportunities for us surgeons practicing in countries like Nepal? We get to see a variety of cases because uh, of the limited number of centers practicing neurosurgery. Due to financial constraints, we have to work at a more economic uh, uh, pace. And so we have the opportunity to exercise more clinical reasoning, history, physical examination, limit our investigations to just what is needed. We can develop the skills of flexibility, improvisation, coordination, organization. It is a great place for teaching and learning because we have a large volume of patients and a big variety of those patients. So let us talk about neurosurgery in Thiruvan University Teaching Hospital, its past. <laughs> So the idea of new starting new surgery at the University Teaching Hospital was uh, because of this eminent person, Professor G. P. Sharma. He was initially, at that time, he was the head of Department of General Surgery and uh, later on the Vice Chancellor of the University Teaching Hospital. So it was in uh, 1994 in Boston that he met uh, Professor Mervyn Bagan and, uh, and asked him uh, for his assistance in establishing a neurosurgery training uh, program at our hospital. And in January 1995, Dr. Bagan traveled to Kathmandu with all the necessary equipment, and his initial efforts were, like uh, previously said, training uh, the neurosurgeons that would last. So the founding members were Professor Shilpakar, Dr. Mohan Sharma, and Dr. B.J. Guru. So among them, Dr. Shilpakar and Dr. Sharma are still with us. So here, is, uh, I'd like to dedicate a few slides to the founding professor, Professor Mervyn Bagan. He did his undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College. He earned his medical degree from uh, Boston University in 1962. Uh, he did his neurosurgical training from National Institute of Health and the John Hopkins Hospital and served as the president and chairman of Health Source New Hampshire. He was the chairman of Health Sources and he did his master's in public health from Boston University in 1995. His contributions to Nepal, he moved to Nepal in 1995 January and worked as a volunteer in Thirvan University Teaching Hospital and was named the uh, visiting professor in 1997. He was instrumental in bringing more than $1 million in medical equipments over the years for the hospital. And you can see in this photograph, His Majesty King, uh, uh, late uh, Majesty King Birendra Bir Bikram Shahadev of Nepal. He awarded, uh, in view of his contribution, he awarded uh, Professor Begin the Superbowl Gorkha Dakshin Bahu Award. It is, it is uh, like a knight award that has been awarded. It's, it is the second highest uh, order uh, which is awarded to the military as, as well as the civilians. <coughs> so his involvement in medical association, he was the president of American Association of Neurological S Surgeons, the most uh, prestigious society, and the New Hampshire Medical Society. He was the treasurer and vice chairman of Council of uh, State of Neurosurgical Societies member of the American College of Surgeons Advisory Council for Neuro Neurosurgical, Neurological Surgery, received several awards like the Congress of Neurological Surgeons Distinguished Service Award, Boston City Hospital Ether Prize, Alumni Award from Boston University, Distinguished Alumni Award from the Boston University School of Medicine, and in honor of his accomplishment and outstanding service to the development of neurosurgery and care of the needy patients in Nepal, he was awarded in 2000 the Humanitarian Award from the WNS. So the timeline of neurosurgery at our hospital, 1995 January, it was established uh, at TUTH, and the first neurosurgical procedure was done at 1995. It was a, laminate, a laminotomy in, in a nurse working there. The first brain tumor was uh, excised in, in 1995, the same year. April, the first spinal instrumentation using Lukey rods. So 1995, the opening ceremony of neuro ward was done, and the first cerebral angiogram was done in 1996. So. <coughs> Uh, our professors, uh, they were then later on, after two years, sent for training. Here is uh, the first photograph is of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shilpakar. He was trained in uh, Maricopa and Emory Hospital. Then uh, in 2000, after, after Dr. Shilpakar came back to Nepal after training, in 2000, uh, Dr. Mohan was sent to University of Washington, Seattle. The first MRI was installed in 2002, and uh, we uh, and and they celebrated a 2000 neurosurgical procedure in 2003. And uh, Dr. Shilpakar also went to Uganda for neuroendoscopic training under under uh, care. 
and in uh, 2006, neuroendoscopy uh, equipments were established. So uh, the training program was first established in two 2007. Uh, it was not until uh, two years after establishment that the first resident, it was a uh, lady neurosurgeon now, it's Dr. Maya Bhattachan. She joined in 2009. And in February 2011, we had an upgrade of the MRI installation of 0.3. And uh, then by December 2013, we had uh, four neurosurgical residents. We can see on the picture, Dr. Maya is on the, on the far right. Dr. Ali, who's here, uh, I'm there, and my junior, Dr. Ram. So it was not, it could not have been possible to achieve uh, in this short span of time without uh, affiliation from the FIANS. And uh, we have a big list of uh, visiting neurosurgeons and their contributions to uh, our hospital. Uh, I, I think we can see quite a few uh, honorary members here in this room from Fians. And uh, instrumental medical persons who may not have come to Nepal but have been key persons in, in the growth of neurosurgery at our place. Uh, we have uh, several of them, uh, Daniel Barrow <coughs> and uh, Ellen Bogan and uh, Professor Richard. Here are a few articles regarding the surgical training program that have been published earlier and its presence. So uh, the Department of Neurosurgery <coughs> has finally uh, separated from the Department of General Surgery in 2017. Earlier it was a part, it was just a unit of, uh, of the General Surgery program. We now have three separate units and uh, five faculty members, six neurosurgical residents in total, two in each year, and we have a 30-bed separate neurosurgical ward. So the Come to the teaching and learning activities of uh, of neurosurgery at our hospital. Um, uh, after finishing med school, we have a three years general surgery training program. After completion of which, there is a three years MCH neurosurgery training program. So MCH uh, program started in two thousand nine. Currently, we have two residents per year, and till now, we have uh, graduated like eight neurosurgical MCH residents through the program. We have our daily routine begins at around 8.45 a.m. with a daily morning conference, weekly case presentation by the final year resident on Sunday, weekly topic presentation by the second year. This is a very rigorous, you cannot just avoid your chance to, you know, uh, <laughs> there's no way out. Uh, the professors are very strict. So there's a weekly topic presentation by the second year resident on Tuesdays, weekly general club meeting by the first year resident on Friday. So each of the three residents have something to present throughout the week. And we have a monthly mortality, morbidity, uh, interdepartmental meeting with uh, mainly with the anesthesia, the pathologists, and neurosurgeons, radiologists. So research, there's a compulsory original article publication to be done, uh, published to be published in peer-reviewed journals by each resident during the residency program, compulsory dissertation by each resident by the end of second year training, and faculty members need to publish original articles for their promotions. So we have uh, six days of uh, OPD service every week, running from Sunday to Friday, spine clinic every Wednesday afternoon, daily ORs running from Sunday to Friday. Uh, each unit gets two days of OR every week. So surgical audit of 2019, we have operated about 549 patients uh, in total, with uh, that's uh, 225 patients in the emergency. We have catered around 4,700 patients in the OPD. Currently, we have a 1.5 Tesla MRI, 128-slice CT scan and angio suit, a microscope, stores uh, endoscopic system, new monitoring system, and uh, ultrasonic aspirator. So this was uh, in 2013 when uh, uh, Dr. Richard first visited our hospital. And in this picture, I'm in scrub with uh, Dr. Richard. We are operating on a 21-year-old young girl with a herniated disc. Uh, and uh, I think uh, after, after 2013, Dr. Richard has been regularly coming to our hospital, training neurosurgeons, helping us with surgeries. So in 2018, we organized a spine week. Uh, you can see, uh, sorry, I don't want to miss the names here. So we can see uh, Richard uh, right in the center, Dr. James Riffenbury, uh, Kathy who's here, and uh, Carol, Rachel, and Drew among the members. And you can see at the background, young uh, neurosurgeons uh, from Nepal. It was a very interesting spine week. We had uh, seminars, lectures. We had uh, a workshop. We had live surgeries. And uh, this is one of the cases we operated on 70 years old male patients with low back ache, uh, spondylolisthesis with uh, T lift. Here's the patient following us in OPD, all well and good. 
The second one was a traumatic cervical disc herniation on a 55 years old male patient who had a fall, ground level fall. And uh, this ACDF was done. And this is the third case. The first uh, artificial disc uh, implantation in the whole of the country was, uh, I'm proud to say that actually. Uh, so this, uh, uh, in 2019, uh, we had the first neurosurgery spine conference, which we plan to overtake every year. So Dr. Richard was one of the keynote speakers. And here, here's him uh, giving a talk on uh, medical malpractice. And uh, this is the dinner, faculty dinner after the event. Uh, here's uh, Rick teaching uh, the, the, <laughs> the juniors about uh, minimally invasive uh, procedures on, on a, on a sawbone model here. And you can see a group of enthusiastic young neurosurgeons swarming around to see. And uh, this is a case of uh, the, the case we operated last, last year. It was a 35 years old lady with uh, carfotic deformity of the back and progressive weakness of the lower limb. She was bed bound. She actually had a history of inadequate treatment of tuberculosis. It was a fused carfotic spine. She had lost all hopes of walking, actually. And uh, she had visited me in the OPD. This uh, Our training program was coming. I, I made her wait, wait, wait for almost a month until, uh, until our program started. This is our OR. You can see Rick and Farooq. Uh, in the, along with us in the operating room. And uh, this is uh, the preoperative x-rays, interoperative pictures, and at the end of a long procedure, we are finally satisfied. And so this is uh, what we, the x-rays we got after the operations with a good kyphotic correction. In about, uh, just about a week later, she was able to stand. And uh, I want to show this uh, video. This lady actually had never dreamed of being able to walk. She had lost all her So it was quite uh, an emotional uh, time, you know, when we got her to walk and the husband was standing right behind to help her. She was so happy she brought, uh, actually I was the lucky person to receive all the gifts and all that. <laughs> So, so this is uh, the team in 2019, finally, when they were leaving, Dr. Farrell, Rick, uh, Richard, and our, our faculty members here. Yeah. So uh, this year onwards, we, have, uh, we are starting this annual uh, TOTH neurosurgical update. Uh, in, uh, so we'll, the COIN, we have termed it the current opinion in neurosurgery, COIN 1, which we'll be conducting uh, this, uh, as soon as I return from here. And we, will, we plan to do a COIN 2 in November. And uh, Richard, we are, we are going to be a part of this, uh, team, this in November. So we're going to have a group of enthusiastic young neurosurgeons attend. We're going to have live uh, surgery workshops. And I, I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah. So uh, this year, finally, we also uh, uh, commemorated the 25th anniversary of neurosurgery at TUTH and uh, felicitated uh, Dr. Mervyn Bagan. Uh, it, it was a very great evening, uh, attended by most of the uh, stakeholders the, uh, from our hospital. Yeah. And our, uh, our hospital's representation in the uh, Nepalese Neurosurgical Forum, uh, Professor Mohan Sharma has been the immediate past president of uh, Nepalese Society of Neurosurgeons Nation from 2017-2019. Dr. Gopal Sedang, who is my colleague, he's a, he's a treasurer of Nation and an executive member of the neurovascular chapter of Nation. I'm uh, currently the executive member of Nation and an executive member of the spine chapter of Nation as well. And in 2019, we conducted the INCONESIN, that was the International uh, Neurosurgical uh, <coughs> Conference here. And we also had the first uh, WFNS educational course uh, in April 2019. So in the future, uh, we plan to increase the faculty numbers. We, ha we plan to have a dedicated neurosurgical ICU initially. Probably we'll start with just a few manageable number of beds. Uh, we want to enroll uh, the faculty into accredited fellowship programs and move towards specialization. Like uh, I, I would probably take up spine and peripheral nerves, while uh, my colleagues would take up endoscopy or, or neurovascular. We want to have a neurosurgery skill lab to, to better train our residents. And we want to be involved in more of international clinical trials as well. And we want our uh, neurosurgical training programs to finally reach the status of accreditation. So, uh, coming to the SWOT analysis of our training program, the, what are our strengths? We have an established neurosurgery training program. We have all modern day neurosurgical facilities with complex neurosurgery possible. We have strong patient trust. 
It is a referral center for neurosurgery, and most of all, we have a strong collaboration with the U.S. neurosurgeons. Our weaknesses, there are no established subspecialties yet. There's limited space, limited OR time, limited health insurance system for the patients. What are our opportunities? We can train and expand the faculties, subspeciality creation, increase international visibility, and promote research and involvement in international clinical trials. Our threats, there is still a high flow of patients to corporate hospitals in the neighboring countries, one of the biggest threats to the existing surgeons as a whole, and several challenges in continuing training programs, which we somehow managed to overcome. So in conclusion, <coughs> it has been a glorious 25 years of neurosurgical development with a great historical background. So we started neurosurgery at an early phase when neurosurgery just entered Nepal. It has been associated, strong association with fiends and other volunteers. Uh, there has been an serious development with many challenges and resource constraints to maturity, experience, and commitment. Uh, we have finally managed to develop into an established neurosurgical referral centers in the country. We have always focused on quality service, education, training, and research, and it is a solid example of how a neurosurgical service can be developed into a res in a res resource constrained low- and middle-income countries. And it is, I think, a perfect example of endeavor, perseverance, international cooperation, and global neurosurgical expansion. Thank you. So I invite you. <laughs> 2000, thank you. 2020 is, uh, we carry the theme of Visit Nepal, <coughs> lifetime experiences. So I, I, I invite you all to come to my country and have a great experience. Thank you so much.